I thought I'd just kick it off with some Q&A before we opened it up to the audience. I'm sure they have lots of questions to ask you later. Um, but your, your career's certainly been an incredible one. Um, with your work bettering the lives of countless people, what was it that first inspired you to take up the cause of human rights? Oh, oh, first of all, thank you for having me at the Oxford Union and uh, thank you for arranging the snow and all the obstacles to, <laughs> to get here. I hope you're all able to hear me at the back. My voice is not very good at projecting, but uh, if you don't hear me, do let me know. So, no, also, thanks, Lavi. That's a flattering introduction. Um, so, wh why did I get involved in this kind of work? I think uh, probably the best way to describe it is that the objective conditions mm -hmm. uh, in India, when, which is where I was born and I spent most of my life, at that time when I was in school, say in 1976, for example, when I left school was a year when um, Indira Gandhi introduced a political emergency, which is the only time when pretty much all civil and political rights were suspended mm -hmm. in India. So it was a period when people were quite radicalized and you know, angry and, and, and I was very involved in the students movement. I was the president of my students <laughs> union as well. And so um, that's kind of in the civil and political side, but also you know, you're, you're kind of surrounded by uh, poverty and inequality and, and the kind of economic social questions which are facing the country. And, and so, and after that, I went to Kenya, and you know, I was that was during President Moi's rule. And so, um, and both my parents were activists. My father's a journalist. My mother's a lawyer. Very involved in the women's movement. So, I almost had <laughs> no choice. I would say. Yeah. Okay. So you've been at Amnesty International for eight years now. What would you say has been the greatest change within the global human rights landscape during your time there? You know, I think the. There's been, it's a period, or it's been a very sort of tumultuous period for human rights, a very volatile period, I think. But what, you know, what happened, and I'm sure each of you have a different kind of reading of, of the world in the last 10 years or so. But uh, my own sense is that uh, post 9-11, uh, you know, the, there's been a sort of a real kind of uh, backsliding on human rights, partly because of the invasion of Iraq, the kind of attacks that we saw in Afghanistan and the war on terror, the so-called war on terror. I think that the, you know, the delicate balance which existed, particularly in the Middle East, but you know, that's had consequences across the world. So I'd say that uh, that's one of the kind of contextual factors. But in terms of the big challenges that human rights has faced in the last few years, I think the, the most kind of visible and the, the what's on the television screens and on the newspapers every day is the you know, complete disregard for protection of civilians. Mm -hmm. So you know, in the last few years, uh, governments are not thinking twice before even attacking uh, hospitals and schools and uh, even funeral processions. We've seen what's happening. In, Eastern Ghouta for the last few days. I mean, but the same thing has been happening in Yemen, in so many parts of the world. So I think that's the one one big challenge we've faced, um, and I think the world is facing. And then they all interrelated. I, I kind of noted two or three different things which have happened, which are the kind of big picture things. So one is the, the attack on international humanitarian law and disregard for civilian protection. Uh, the second, which is almost a consequence of that, you could say, is a massive displacement of population. So I think in the history of the world, we've not had 65 million people or so displaced, uh, 40 or so within the, uh, their own countries and 22 million or so outside their country. So we have a global refugee crisis like we've never seen before. And probably the in the last one year, the, the biggest sort of refugee crisis in the world, historically or we've, in the last 10 years, we've been thinking about the Middle East and then Africa. But now we've had the, you know, the attack on the Rohingyas mm -hmm. in Myanmar. And I think that's occupied our minds and occupied, you know, engaged uh, people across the world, worried people across the world. So I would say the refugee crisis, uh, you know, and, and to me, like each of these, so international humanitarian law has been disregarded if you think of the civilian protection issues. But if you think of the refugee crisis, we have the refugee convention, which most European countries are signatory to. And, that's been completely flouted or you know violated uh, in its very core so that's the second issue and the third issue is which is a, a relatively new phenomenon in some ways which is that historically say amnesty has been battling with unelected illegitimate leaders so you know dictators and authoritarians we now have a new breed of elected dictators authoritarians and this is very new for us because these people are duly elected you know and so mm -hmm. 
obviously Trump is the one which is most in our minds, but you know we can't forget <coughs> Erdogan in Turkey or, yeah. or I mean even the Myanmar government you know is very very popular amongst people. You have Putin, so th those are not places where you have formal proper elections, but. The point I'm making, or oh, Modi, or Duterte, or Orban, closer closer to Europe here, uh, the more they violate human rights, the more popular <laughs> they're becoming. You know, in their own national context. So we are dealing with a new phenomenon there. Um, and I mean, if you take a place like Turkey, again, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Uh, that this is a country where we have about 50,000 people now in prison, and locked up. Mm -hmm. Um, more than 150 journalists are in prison. In fact, there's a kind of a standing joke, which is not so funny if you think about it, that if you want to meet a journalist in Turkey, where do you go? You go to prison. They're all there. Almost 200 media outlets have been closed down. In fact, the chair and director of Amnesty Turkey were arrested. The chair is still in jail, uh, but along with, you know, thousands of others. So I'd say that, I mean, if you ask me what are the three big things which are in my mind, I'd say that, yeah, number one, the attack on civilian protection, civilians, the violation of international humanitarian law. Second is the big refugee crisis and the third is the attack uh, on basic freedoms, which is what we are seeing in all these countries. So, you know, freedom of expression, association, assembly, all these things and in countries which we didn't expect this to happen as well. Um, and this, you know, in a, in a practical sense, when you think about what's happening on the ground, a lot of human rights defenders are under attack. So we've actually launched a campaign called Brave within Amnesty to just protect these human rights defenders. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we are talking about, and when you think of human rights defenders, I, I mentioned journalists and lawyers, these are kind of obvious ones, but it's not even restricted to the obvious kind of human rights activists. It could be an environmental, you know, land rights activist, it could be an anti-corruption activist. So it's a, it's a much broader sweep of attack on anybody who is seen as a dissenter to the government. So. So I'll come back to the idea of populism in just a second. Um, but before we go on to that, what would you say has been the biggest challenge that you faced whilst leaving the organisation? You mean internally within Amnesty? I mean, Amnesty, you, you're a management student, so I should, I should, I'm sure there are others who are kind of looking at kind of, because Amnesty is very interesting and, and I'm very glad that we have the Amnesty students group here as well from Oxford. And, and uh, Amnesty is interesting because on the one hand, we are an organisation like any other organisation which requires you know, management, uh, which it, which needs to be managed like you manage. So, you know, we have 3,000 full-time staff. We have hundreds of thousands of volunteers and activists like some of them are here today. But there's a kind of managerial side, you know, Amnesty's annual income is something like in the order of 250 million euros or dollars. Um, so you can't, you know, when, when all of these organizations started in 1961, in the case of Amnesty, it was a few people getting together, you know, wanting to release political prisoners, and it's a whole different ball game when you have a large organization. So managerially, it's very interesting, you know, because we've we've had to make some big internal decisions and changes, um, which are not easy to make in an organization. Because people who come to Amnesty don't have the same incentives yeah. as you know if you're working in I don't know Citibank or wherever you're going to go <laughs> next, or you know, or uh, McKinsey or, or whatever. You know, it's a different incentive structure because the people who go to the corporate world. The private sector are going because they they're clear about their goals. You know they want you know they in, and whereas here people are passionate. They are coming to Amnesty because they believe in human rights and they feel a sense of ownership over the organisation. And so one of the big changes we went through in the last uh, five years or so is kind of coming to terms with the new external reality in the world. And this new external reality is very different from the reality we had in 1961. So the 61 model of amnesty, which is like most other human rights organizations, which were born in Europe or the United States, was a solidarity model, which is to say that, you know, people in this part of the world understood human rights better. You know, there was a longer his history of talking about democracy, human rights. So they were trying to help the people in Africa, Asia, Latin America to do the right thing. And the way in which this was done in the amnesty context was that we had members in Europe or the United States or Canada, the rich countries, who then put pressure on their governments to persuade the governments in developing countries to do the right thing. And the first, six, we're almost 57 years old now, Amnesty, and, and it worked wonderfully, I think, for the first 50 years. I mean, Amnesty's achievements are, are long, you know, no question about it. We got the Nobel Peace Prize for the work on the UN Convention Against Torture. I mean, the list is long. I wouldn't want to go through all of it. and. But the question really is that if you look at the next 50 years, um, 
is the is the solidarity model going to work? And I think this is more difficult for it to work in its current form because Western governments themselves have lost a lot of their moral legitimacy because of the kinds of double standards they have used on, in in relation to human rights. Uh, the emergence of China has completely changed the kind of you know the power structure. So. My argument has been, and I think there's a lot of support also from uh, key people inside and outside the organization, that we need to now combine the solidarity model with also a kind of agency model, that people from these countries themselves should be holding their own governments to account, and we need to get these two pieces to work together. It's easier said than done, because there's still many places, like you know, if you're in China, or Russia, you can't expect people from those countries to speak up without facing consequences. So, but there are more and more countries where, you know, I, my country in India and in Brazil, Nigeria, Indonesia, we've now set up amnesties in all of these places and we're getting more members there. Uh, it also creates more legitimacy because Western government, even the southern or developing country governments who don't want to do the right thing, the first thing they say is, oh, you guys are some Western organization with a Western agenda. But now the whole of Am Amnesty's work in Africa is done from Africa by Africans. You know? So you know, at least that argument can't be made. So. Yeah. How do you think that people's perceptions of human rights globally have shifted over the past few years? Yeah, I mean, that that's kind of linked to the first conversation we started. And I think it's... Um, it's, it has changed a lot and it has changed because, you know, the, the, the kind of um, discourse that these kind of populist leaders have brought into the, into the kind of mainstream now is that you have to fundamentally choose between security on the one hand or economic development and growth on the one hand and human rights. So that's constantly what you're being told, that it's kind of human rights or security. Mm -hmm. uh, and our argument is that it's human rights for security. You know, you can't actually have sustained security. You, you can't have, and, and it's a kind of classic line which, uh, which Kofi Annan had used also in the context of the 2005 UN summit that you can't have peace without development, you can't have development without peace, and you can't have either without human rights if you want to sustain it. Um, but, but, but these people have got a lot of currency and you know, they've done very well to start establishing, you know, asking questions about the validity of the human rights construct itself. Uh, so I think there's, that's on the one hand, so that's, I just want to put that in context. But the other thing is, you know, if, you, if you think about, and, and maybe we'll come more into this when we go into the Q&A, because there's a lot to be said on this question. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say that, uh, yeah, in, and you know, if you, if you go to a place like Brazil, for example, where for, you know, Amnesty's agenda in Brazil would focus a lot on the people in the favelas, the poor, the, you know, and because there's a massive uh, incarceration linked to the drug issues and, and the violence issues in the, in the favelas, uh, you find that a lot of the people who are in jails in Brazil are young black men, not dissimilar to the United States, incidentally. Uh, so we would always, you know, talk about how there should be due process in dealing with these young black uh, boys and men. Now, if you ask the average Brazilian in Rio or Sao Paulo, so then they say, so Amnesty is just protecting the bad guys. So why are you worried about these people who are, after all, criminals? You know, so, and in an aspirational middle class country like India or, or Brazil or Nigeria, Indonesia, they feel that these kind of things like, you know, rule of law and processes like this, are a, are a nuisance, you know, because our country needs to grow, we need to do the right thing. Let's do all this human rights stuff later. You know? And and you have Singapore, for example, which is a great example to show, you know, see how they're doing. They're doing brilliantly, they're, they're fine without human rights, or the Gulf countries, or Rwanda has done perfectly well. Why do you want to create a nuisance here, you know? So so I think perception has changed, and it's, it's very important for Amnesty also to kind of uh, think about this. And and one of the things we are, we are doing, Lali, is to really kind of rethink how we talk about these issues to the public because historically the way Amnesty would deal with this is to, like if you take the refugee crisis, yeah? So Amnesty's view would be that the refugee convention gives ref every uh, asylum seeker or person who is a, re a refugee by definition is one who is fleeing from war and persecution. Mm -hmm. The refugee convention gives them rights that, and that those rights have to be, uh, you know, respected by every government certainly the ones who have signed up to the Refugee Convention, but anybody else. So it's kind of intrinsically right that that's the right thing to do. Uh, but obviously now we need to understand that there's a big section of the populations in these countries who actually would not buy into the intrinsic value of refugee rights. So we have to also talk about it in a different way. And one of the things we've, di we've discovered is that 
Um, in, and this is kind of to the, going back to the roots of amnesty, which is to look at the whole issue of not just laws and you know institutions in a global, international, abstract way, but to actually bring this down to individuals and human beings. And when you think about refugees as humans, as individuals, the conversation shifts from you know this is our Europe is ours and you know all this kind of uh, border fencing mentality and walls to talk about think about them as human beings. The, the, there's all the analysis and the kind of market uh, consumer perception or you know kind of public perception shows that for example if you take an issue like this on the one you have like a maybe 20 30 percent of the population who's absolutely against bringing in refugees it's a bit like the brexit mm -hmm. conversation right and near 20 30 percent who are very much in in favor of all these rights and presumably a lot of the people who are sitting in this audience understand these issues and have a more internationalist perspective but then you have 30 40 percent who are in the middle the sort of persuadable middle and um, amnesty's communications or the communications of people who believe in these values historically has been kind of targeting the people who already agree with us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you kind of think of all these guardian reading, you know, those kind of more progressive type people. <laughs> and which is slightly unfortunate because if you think of the origins of human rights, it comes very much from a liberal, you know, uh, liberal in the US kind of uh, sense, you know, thinking much yeah. more about individual liberties, etc. But the human rights discourse has now ended up in a, in a box. So, we're trying to also figure out how do you talk about these issues in a way that it's not seen as being in one box or the other, that it's actually a human box, you know, appealing to humanity rather than isms and ideologies. So, so just yeah. this is just an example. I think that video perfectly highlighted how powerful a me uh, medium video can be. Um, what do you make of the role that technology and social media can play? No, I mean, th th nobody's mastered uh, social media more than, you know, the Trumps and, uh, and, and the folks like that. I mean, certainly the, in, in the Indian context, I know that the airwaves on social media are completely occupied by those who are taking an Islamophobic position, by those who are taking an anti-Rohingya uh, position, for example. And uh, I think those who believe, uh, no, those who... Is that, is that a <laughs> signal? Oh. No. Okay. <laughs> no, so uh, I think there's a lot to be done just for, for those of us who believe in these values to actually become much sharper on how you mm -hmm. use these things. I mean, because, and, and it's also the case now that the traditional kind of battleground, which used to be the public square or, you know, the newspaper has now shifted online. Everything has now moved online. So Amnesty, which historically has not done much work in the kind of technology space. We've been dragged into the technology discussion, you know, yeah. willy-nilly. We, we don't have a choice. And, uh, and so I, I talk about taking human rights in a kind of opportunities and threats kind of framework. And the opportunities are clear. Uh, there's, you know, plenty of opportunity. We can come back to that. But uh, we also partly trying to make sure that people understand the kind of the risks and the threats around technology. And just to give you uh, two or three kind of dimensions of that, and this is not so much about social media, but you know, more broadly about the use of technology yeah. and human rights. So I think the one area which you know we've, uh, we we by the way we now have a team of about 15 people across the globe, and we've just opened it. Uh, we've just got a set up in Silicon Valley to actually work more directly with the tech companies on this. Uh, but so the one dimension we've done a lot of work on is the right to privacy, mm -hmm. and the right to privacy for us is very linked to protecting the identity of human rights defenders who are now uh, being tracked and attacked online. Um, so, I mean, so the work which, you know, say Snowden has done, we've been working a lot with, uh, you know, supporting uh, him and his work as a whistleblower, mm -hmm. but it goes far beyond that. We've been doing a lot of work with tech companies on the issue of encryption, and we've had a big success just two weeks ago with Microsoft, which was one of the laggards. Uh, Skype was not encrypted at all until now with multi-user Skype. And now they've agreed to do that. And they were very clear that Amnesty's pressure was very instrumental in doing the, in getting this done. Most of the other messaging apps have now moved. We, we've run a campaign. We've been ranking the messaging apps over the last few years to kind of put pressure on them to move. But so the whole issue of surveillance is, is very, very important. You're probably aware that um, I mean, we've done studies, for example, three quarters of women have faced some kind of online abuse, uh, one form or the other. So, you know, there's a whole issue of kind of gender and women's rights around that. And um, I think the, 
the, the second dimension is on the discriminatory uh, sort of aspects of uh, using technology. So, you may be aware that in the US and UK and increasingly in more countries, the al algorithms are being used in very practical ways, for example, like predictive policing. Mm -hmm. And so, in the US, it's, there's a lot of studies now to show that essentially this reinforces existing biases because it uses past data to identify potential, uh, you know, uh, offenders. And so, the whole issue of how do you ensure that the, the kind of a, the discriminatory angle is taken care of is the second one. And then the third one is, of course, much more aggressive stuff like, you know, automated weapon systems, for example. And there you have the whole issue of transparency and accountability around this, because even in the use of drones, for example, we had an ongoing battle, even with the Obama administration, yeah. in the use of drones in Pakistan and other North Waziristan, Yemen. So, you really don't know what the chain of command is, but if this is all being handled by algorithms in future, I mean, the risks are, are very, very, in fact, we had a panel last week in Munich where I asked Eric Smith this question from Google as to what what exactly you're going to do about this and his response was no 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 if it comes to anything which is life and death then it can't be left to algorithms it has to be a human agency but we have to see we'll hold him to that as to what does that mean in practice so so I, I think this to close so there's a whole issue of regulation as well on tech because you know we can't expect these four or five tech companies to play God you know because between them they are controlling the entire data space and and just to give you one example, and some of you may, you know, we talked about the Rohingya situation. Now, Zuckerberg went around in the last two, three years to offer a kind of free uh, internet access to developing countries. I don't know if, if you're aware of this, but India, for example, rejected it because it was violating the net neutrality principle, but Myanmar agreed to it. So, the Facebook users in Myanmar, in the space of three years, went up from 1 million to, I think, 4 million. And the entire anti Rohingya propaganda is being run on Facebook. Right. So now you have a situation there where Facebook doesn't want to intervene, and probably rightly so, but the government is actively supporting this because they are very much in favor of a campaign which is anti Rohingya. So this serious governance and regulatory issues which come into play. But on the positive side, you know, you could think of uh, you know you could think of a technology which can enhance freedoms, a technology which could enhance inclusiveness and a technology which could also improve dignity for people. You know, we, we don't have enough time to even talk about the possible employment risks. I mean, if you just the usual one, which the example which is given is of uh, driverless trucks in the US, which is going to displace almost, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. But if you think of a country like Ethiopia, the studies now, bank studies, World Bank studies that think of Ethiopia, Nigeria, or even India, even OECD countries will see quite significant uh, job displacement. Now, that's not a reason not to work on technology, but then you need to put the mitigating plans in place because normally what happens is it's the weakest and the poorest who are displaced first. Yeah. So, one final question from me before we move on to taking some from the audience. What do you think can be done in the years to come to encourage and promote a human rights culture? And how can we all become more involved in what's going on in the world around us? So, I, I talked about mostly depressing stuff until now, but let me let me also, you know, because we just released our uh, annual report in, in Washington DC for the first time in Amnesty's history, we launched it from the Capitol building in the US to kind of take on, you know, Trump's uh, sort of uh, anti-human rights things head on. I, I don't know if you're aware, in the last one year, I mean, obviously he started off by saying that torture is completely acceptable. This last month, he issued an executive order saying that Guantanamo Bay prison should remain open. They've introduced a global gag rule, which essentially takes out $1.8 billion of funding uh, for reproductive care for women, which is directly, you know, an assault on women's rights and not to talk about the Muslim ban and the travel ban and, and a massive reduction in the refugee resettlement number. So, we did it there. But the reason I'm saying this is because as we were running our kind of uh, press conference and launch inside Capitol building, we had school kids outside the building, you know, on the Florida shooting issue and they have, uh, you know, they have been able to in the last two weeks move the debate on the NRA and gun control more than, you know, I think advocacy groups and campaigners have managed to do in decades. If you take the Me Too campaign we've seen in the last few months, I mean, amazing things have happened in the last few months and, and a lot of this are women and, and young people who are pushing the boundaries on this and I'm saying this because this is happening across the world. So, as you have these authoritarian rulers, as you have more and more attacks on human rights, 
you are also seeing a resurgence of people power and action. So, Poland for example, where there was a plan by the government to really curb the independence of the judiciary, you had you know, thousands and thousands of people. South Korea, you know, we have had this amazing, the, go the government had to change. You think of a place like um, a continent like Africa, where you would say, you know, nobody thought Mugabe is going anywhere. <laughs> I mean, yeah. 37 years later, but he's gone. Zuma has gone. Uh, Ethiopian Prime Minister has gone. Uh, Santos has gone in Angola. You know, four or five leaders who have been there 20, 30 years. All of them have gone peacefully and almost all of them have gone through people power, people protest, people raising their voice. So, uh, I wanted to just say that uh, while things are, are tough, but it's kind of amnesty's kind of core DNA is that ordinary people coming together uh, is what's going to make a difference to challenge and hold these leaders to account. And I think that's a powerful kind of statement to make. But yeah, that's great. I think that's probably the perfect time actually to open up some questions from the audience. If questions popped up right here at the front of here. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah. So one of the things we find that is a great and bad thing about amnesty at the society here is the sheer range of issues that um, Amnesty deals with. It's such a universal advocacy issue, one of the most universal. Um, so basically we find it quite hard, yeah, it's quite hard to focus on so many campaigns. Um, and I wonder if this issue extends to the organisation as a whole or if the resources that Amnesty has allows it to really focus or if they need to prioritise in any way. Uh, you know, and, and, and there's, there's always kind of the challenge between, so obviously we have strategic goals, we have a plan, we've got a you know, set of priorities and at the global level we run two big global campaigns. There's only two and we, we really narrowed it down to two. One is called I Welcome, which is on the global refugee question and the second is called Brave, which is on defending human rights. Uh, those who are to defend those who are defending human rights, so you know, protecting those who are fighting for human rights. So, they are two big global campaigns, but you know, it's uh, we are not quite like a kind of business operation where if you have people who come to you and say that you know they are being tortured or you know they are facing uh, the death penalty, etc., you can't say you are not in my plan, you know, uh, that is not an option for us. So, this is a constant struggle as to how do you respond to things as they are evolving um, and crises, uh, you know, we do not plan. If Yemen blows up, I, I can't say Yemen is not in my plan. <laughs> so it's just, we have to deal with it. So, it is always a challenge, but we try and keep about uh, two thirds of our overall resource goes towards long term planned work and a third towards crises. Um, and we try and keep within the kind of focused approach. But, you know, I, I also think that if you historically think of Amnesty's work, one of the reasons Amnesty remains the, the largest and most relevant organization globally on human rights, uh, it is because we have adapted you know, over time. So, f when we started we were fighting to release political prisoners from, from uh, incarceration. Uh, then of course, you realize that when they are in prison, they are being tortured. So, our whole work on torture came out of that. And then of course, they are being executed, which, which is why we ended up with the work on death penalty. Um, and you know, you, you could at each stage say why you are doing something different, uh, but you are adapting. I mean, death penalty is a an excellent example, Amnesty has remained uh, over 40 years or so our death penalty campaign. When we started the campaign, uh, there were probably only about uh, 30 countries or so who were not executing people. Today, there are only about 30 countries still executing people. You know. So, but it goes on and on. So, I mean, you, and you, you, if you think about it, there were not that many women political prisoners. You know. So, the whole issue of women's rights came out with, through the realization that you have you know 50 percent of the population who are facing a whole different set of issues and we can't say that you know managerially we are going to focus on death penalty and torture. And as developing countries became more important and voices from the global south so to speak became more important, the issues of uh, economic social rights which is you know water, health, education, poverty as human rights became more and more prominent because these are totally interlinked anyway, because if you think about it, those who are poor are exactly those who have no voice and those who have no voice remain poor. You know. So, the, the, but you know, and of course, the Universal Declaration says that these two are indivisible and uh, interdependent and two sides of the same coin. But in reality, Western based human rights organization, when you say human rights in the West, it means civil and political rights which does not resonate in the same way for people who are living in Nigeria or Burkina Faso or wherever. So, so I mean, uh, it is a, it's a challenge, it is a good question. Uh, I do not think there is an easy answer to that one. Yeah, I see a question popped up right here at the front of the head.
Uh, is there one uh, important, really important life lesson from your experiences that you'd like to share with us? No, I, I think, you know, it's just, uh, I, for me, people al often ask me a kind of related question as to, because the nature of our work is such that, you know, I, I'm f just to give you an example, you know, that we had the Turkish, for, uh, last week I was in Munich at the Munich Security Conference, and I, and I met several leaders, if you, you know, like Prime Minister Abadi, who was the Prime Minister of Iraq, I met him, and he was angry with me because of our report on Mosul, he said, you know, here we are, you know, we, we freed Mosul from the Islamic State and what does Amnesty do? You're talking about civilian protection, you know. Why don't you understand that we're doing such an important job? So he was like, and the Turkish Foreign Minister, I met him, he refused to have a meeting with him. I accosted him on the, on the corridor as he was walking and I said, why have you locked up our chair and there's no evidence and the, the police is not even presenting any evidence against him. So he shouted at me, you know, I'm never going to talk to you again, you're lying and this, you know, so this is kind of, you get all this negative stuff coming at you. Governments don't like to be told the truth, right? That's never something which they like when you speak truth to power. But on the other hand, I'm constantly, you know, when you travel, you, like I was recently in Peru and you meet Maxima Acuna, who's this woman who's fought against this Canadian mining company uh, about her own land. That company was able to clear all the land, entire land in the, this is in the, in the Andean mountains in Cajamarca, Bamba Marca, they've cleared everybody else. This one woman, she's an indigenous woman, she's sitting there on her own. She, all the threats for, for, I don't know how many years she's been fighting it off and she's managed to keep her land. We just won a court case uh, in her favor. So you meet people like this and I'm constantly meeting people like this in the front end who are the brave people who we are fighting for. And that's what gives me huge kind of inspiration and motivation. And, and that's my life lesson, if you wish, that, you know, that if you stand up for your rights, I mean, so in the end, truth and justice will prevail, but it's, it's, a, yeah, it's a tough gig. Right, I uh, see so your questions popped up at the back There's of that. More um, do you think that human rights also extends to national sovereign rights? So you mentioned Viktor Orban and Hungary. What if the Hungarians don't want anything to do with Syria? They don't want to bomb Syria. They don't want to. They don't want to have any uh, uh, part in the solution to the Syrian crisis. What if they just want to stay out of it? In their eyes, they would view their human rights as wanting to retain their own sovereign rights, not to interfere with the situation. Yeah, at all. I mean, but that's the kind of. This is the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948, 2018, and from day one, this has been the sort of Chinese argument, the Russian argument that you know ultimately. Uh, and in a sense, it's also the United States argument. This is the paradox of it, right? So the United States is the number one, you know, uh, you know, sort of uh, voice against any international kind of interference in national processes. So, I mean, they've hardly signed on to any international uh, conventions and treaties, the US compared to most developed countries. Um, and this is a paradox, I think, because with globalization, with the spread of technology, with people moving so much from place to place, I'm not talking about the refugees moving, but you know, everybody else, those who are moving uh, in a kind of, uh, in a documented way, so to speak, uh, you can't have a situation where you're trying to find national solutions because most of our problems are not national. They're, they're crossing boundaries. I mean, climate change, of course, is the most obvious example of it, but every single problem we're dealing with crosses borders, you know, so, uh, so what these people are doing is interesting. So the Orban argument, or I don't know if you're aware of the Lex NGO bill that he's brought in now against NGOs. So now you're in a situation where if an NGO, and this includes Amnesty in Hungary, which is under direct threat of closure, because now if you receive the smallest amount of money, I, I don't know, David, I don't know where David's sitting, but the amount, I don't know, it's like $5,000 or something that if you receive some tiny amount of money from abroad, you have to declare it to the government and essentially if you do anything which is supporting refugee rights, they, they're going to shut you down, you know. So, uh, but, and the way these guys have done it, and Trump is not different in that sense, is to kind of create this uber nationalist uh, hype around it to say that, you know, if you're, uh, we have this in India as well, by the way. So if you, if you don't support uh, Hindutva, which is a kind of Hindu nationalism, then you're anti-national, you know. So you're immediately branded as, uh, you know, not a patriot, but a betrayer of, of national pride. So, so this is a, this is how the debate is being uh, panned out. And I guess that's a kind of, in some ways, the Brexit discussion is the same, that, you know, the Europeans have come, they're taking over all our, our, our ability to make decisions locally. So it's not a new discourse, I don't think. And, and our view is that when it comes to, 
uh, you know the, the, the universal declaration of human rights and all the UN institutions were formed after the second world war exactly to take, co take care of uh, all of the transnational issues which can only be sorted out by talking, by having dialogue, by having institutions which deal with the cross national challenges. So, the refugee convention recognize the fact that there will be refugees, there will be wars and at that point there has to be a shared global responsibility. So, Orban can say that he does not want to be part of it, but he also has signed up to the values of the European Union which are founded in human rights. But I mean th uh, this is my take on it, I am sure there is multiple views on it and I think this is a this is a battle of ideas as well, you know it is not just a battle of uh, the physical battle of the refugees trying to push through the fences in Hungary and with dogs set on them. It is a much deeper debate. I see a question just at the back over there. Um, I have a slightly different question. Uh, if you go at, your, at Amnesty International website and search for countries, you can find Palestine, but Kosovo is still under Serbia and all of the reports still list Serbia as a part of uh, Kosovo as a part of Serbia. Is that a specific message from Amnesty International or you just ha are not recognizing the country or it has not just has not been changed? Uh, David, you may be able to answer that better because we I get asked this kind of question often. We follow the UN classification. That is essentially the way in which we try to do it. Now, there may be specific cases where we need to make corrections. David, do you have a it is essentially the UN classification, if, if, but we can talk offline as well in case there is a specific thing on the website which needs to be looked at. Uh, because you know uh, and Palestine is interesting right because it, it, uh, now we have changed the status slightly because the UN has given it a slightly different status, but typically uh, this is very contentious question as to how do you classify a, a, a state a state. So, we go strictly by UN member state classifications, um, so you know irrespective of what we may think and we also do not take a position on self determination, we get asked this question a lot when it comes to the Catalon, Catalan question, mm -hmm. we do not take a view on that. We have a view on uh, human rights violations around the right to self determination if people are as long as they are peacefully protesting, we would support their right to peaceful protest, but we do not take a view on uh, statehood and member states etcetera. So, I think there was one final question at the front, um, yeah. So, um, as a student activist, in a place like Oxford, we have we very encouraging results. A lot of people really want to get involved. But as Rowling, I think, pointed out, there are also a lot of people, a lot of privileged people, who are very comfortable sitting back and not doing anything. And I think that with um, a resurgence of populism, there's also been a large degree of apathy of people who think they can't do anything about it, so they're not going to get involved. And um, I was just wondering if you would have any advice on how to. Uh, get the movement going and how to fight uh, some apathy that could be uh, that could be coming through. You guys are doing that work <laughs> in the context of the students union here you are talking uh, I think there is no shortcut to it I think we have to you know make people because we had Dr. Ambedkar in India who, who wrote the Indian constitution and he had three very sort of pithy words of explaining how to go about this. So, the first step was to educate, the second was to organize and the third was to agitate you know and so, uh, but often people are not self educated about the issues. So, I think just uh, I mean all of you obviously I think are the ones who are more educated, but I am sure there are others who need that uh, information because often we just assume that people know about these issues. I am so surprised when I talk to people who are not thinking about this that you know if you if you tell them that there is 22 million refugees in the world and that thousands of people are dying in the Mediterranean because the European governments are pushing them into the water pretty much they find it hard to even believe this you know. So, I mean just giving facts in a simple way sharing that information we have you know one of one big piece of Amnesty's work is called human rights education and we now have an online MOOC as well because that is kind of cool thing to have uh, which is the online education. But I mean it is cool on the one hand, but it is also the case that historically Amnesty went school to school and we had teachers being trained by Amnesty staff etcetera, but now we have the option of using online coaching etcetera and it is got huge pick up you know and so, I mean we for the first time in the history of Amnesty we have actually started using paid Facebook advertising and in places like in the most unexpected places Pakistan, Nigeria, Egypt you know we in the last one year we have had a million members who have joined us uh, by April we will hit the 1 million mark who have joined us from all these places. So, <coughs> on the one hand you are right that there is a lot of apathy, on the other hand there is also a lot of anger and outrage right now and people are looking to find ways of engaging. 
so in the US Amnesty USA for example, which is our national US chapter, shortly after Trump got elected, our Twitter following in the US went up from 1 million to about 4 million. And this is really not as if you know Amnesty USA had done a huge amount. It's just that there's so much thirst and anger, and people are looking for channels. So I think you know it's on the one hand a difficult point in history, but on the other hand, it's also a huge moment of opportunity when people are you know angry, a bit confused, they don't quite know how. And you know, if you think about things like the Arab Spring, etc., where people came out in the millions, but then the next year of Brazil, I mean, we've had like amazing street rev street agitations in Brazil. But everything then dissipates, you know, you think of the Occupy protest, it's a, it comes and it goes. So kind of giving it some kind of a channel to the energy because what Amnesty and organizations like us do is they provide a, pla a structured platform where you actually not just, you know, it's not just outrage, but you can also engage, that you can structure your thinking, you're converting it into policy recommendations, you're able to put pressure on governments. So I think there's a huge scope for that. So yeah, I would say, and, and it's relatively easy to get involved in Amnesty, much as you have different issues, but campaigns are there, you know, campaigns are the obvious way in which if there's some issue which you're more uh, interested in, if you're more focused on, uh, then there is a way, there's a way to enter and get involved in that issue in your own context, because that's the benefit of having a kind of cafeteria model, you know, you can't tell everybody you should only do death penalty, so if someone's interested in Kosovo, Serbia, we do work on that, so then they could get involved in what they're interested in, so. Okay. So I think that's unfortunately all we've got time for this evening. Um, if you could all join me in saying a huge thank you to Salil for joining us this evening. Thank you.